right? But was not uh, particularly interested in studying science the way some of my classmates were at the time. Um, and my powers of observation, I would say, were just basically to entertain myself. I loved looking at things and exploring things, examining things outside. Um, part of observation is um, documentation, and I was really good at that. Here is how I documented my science fair project at age six. That was it. So from there, we jump 25 years. I have uh, gotten myself a, uh, a degree in English literature, and I worked uh, on a travel magazine published by the National Geographic Society. And from there, moved on to uh, writing about nature. And the first book I wrote was on the butterfly. And at the time, I knew nothing about butterflies, but that they were interesting and that I could learn something about them. This was the beginning of a series of children's books I wrote. Uh, for young readers on natural history topics. And I loved doing the research and reading everything I could get my hands on about butterflies. And of course, observing them in the natural world uh, informed with my new knowledge. So I wrote a book on butterflies. And once you write a book on anything, you're an author. So I became an author of nature books. And then the offers began pouring in and I wrote a book on beetles and knew nothing about beetles at the time, but had lots in my garden to observe and write about. And then I wrote a book on uh, the ocean. And it, this is not, I am not either an entomologist or an oceanographer, but I knew how to do some research. And this was, these are books for young readers. And what I found was I really enjoyed digging into the literature on all sorts of things happening in the ocean in terms of the, the ecosystems and the threats to the ocean and the variety of forms, biodiversity, and then explaining that simply and accurately to young readers. And it's a real challenge. There is a lot of literature uh, that is really not appropriate for young readers because it's, it's way over their head or it's not interesting or it's not uh, really accurate because it's so oversimplified. So early on, I found that challenge was really something that excited me. I moved on to writing other books. Uh, these are for very young readers on snakes, owls, hawks, and falcons. And then on to a series on North American ecosystems. And this series took me into the deserts of the Southwest, the Mississippi River, the tundra, and to the Pacific coast. And uh, it was all virtual travel at the time. I did visit these places and again, learned about them um, through the, the book research I did and the interviews I did with uh, different scientists. It was this book on the Pacific coast that introduced me to the wonderful little bird that would change my life, which is the marbled marillet. This is the young fluffy chick of this very interesting seabird. Uh, a member of the Alcid or Auk family that includes birds that you might be more familiar with, such as puffins, uh, common murres, dove keys, rhinoceros auklets, which are very uh, abundant here in the Salish Sea. This little bird captured my heart. I was living in Virginia at the time and started wondering about its life history and learned that it was endangered that the forests where it nested were threatened and being logged, and this bird needed some attention. So I began uh, writing one chapter in that book on Pacific ecosystems, and then realized I had a much bigger story and fell in love with this bird, moved my family from Virginia to California, where I began tagging along with the scientists who were studying this bird. This is a very, very challenging bird to observe. It is uh, on the water, uh, quite uh, striking in this beautiful black and white plumage. They're robin-sized seabirds and they spend most of their life out at sea, coming inland only to nest. And this whole family of birds behaves this way. This bird though, flies inland, not to nest on the rocky outcroppings along the coast or in burrows or on islets, but in trees, in enormous old growth and mature Douglas firs, Western red cedars, 
uh, Sitka spruces, these enormous trees where the bird nests up on the high limbs, free from predators for the most part. And it's very difficult to find these nests. It's very difficult to study this bird at sea. And so what kind of observation was I able to do? Well, not much. I realized that observing the scientists who were observing the Merlets was a really interesting story. How do you study? How do you observe something you really can't see? The Merlets are active in the early light, um, pre-dawn light, uh, very difficult to see. They fly high above the water when they leave the water to come into nest and they fly way over the 200 foot high trees, moving onto the nest and essentially remaining silent um, to the observer on the ground. So how do you find these nests? What kinds of equipment do you need? How do you stake out the forest and the forest stands to make some kind of observation about these birds? And while this bird looks obvious, it's small, robin sized, and you'll see it in flocks on the water throughout the Salish Sea um, and up into um, Alaska, all the way down to central California. But what's interesting is that this bird was at the center of the greatest ornithological mystery in North America. No one could find where this bird nested, despite the fact that in the summertime, this bird turned these beautiful brown, chocolate brown, bark brown colors. No one connected the fact that this color plumage would help camouflage the merlet in the forest. And no one looked in the forest because this is where these birds didn't nest. They nested on the rocky outcrops with all the other alcids. No one thought this bird would nest in the trees. So it took a really long time for them to find where the bird nested, 185 years. That story intrigued me and propelled me into um, the world of discovery for this species going back to Captain Cook's voyage and, and earlier to follow the path, the story of how scientists made their observations and linked all the pieces of the puzzle together. So the merlet is a seabird, but what's so interesting about it is it has these sharp pointed wings it uses to fly underwater to pursue its prey, schooling fish such as sand lance and herring, anchovy, and the same wings it uses to fly in the air. So scientists have, have observed the bird flying underwater, breaking the surface and continuing flying directly into the forest where they nest. So they're strong underwater pursuit divers. Here, one of my favorite pictures of the marble merlet, it's a blur. Um, these birds fly really fast. They fly as far as 55 miles inland to find their nesting sites, these wide platforms on the mossy branches of these mature trees. Um, the merlet has earned the nickname of a baked potato with a beak, the buzz bomb, the Australian hummingbird, and the little hell diver. And you can see here, it's a very heavy bodied bird. Its wings are relatively small and it whirs them almost like a hummingbird to keep its um, body airborne. The nest, the first nest was discovered in 1974. The merlet was the last of all uh, 800 or so North American breeding birds to have its nest discovered. This is really late. We had put a man on the moon by this point, but we had not found the marble merlet nest. So it happened by accident after years of ornithologists and birders and egg collectors trying to find the nest. It happened by accident, uh, a tree trimmer um, climbing a tree to do a safety trim, nearly stepped on a little bird he described as a porcupine with a beak sticking out. It was the marbled merlet chick with its downy pin feathers still in place, hunkered down on the top of a nest branch. So this is the, the merlet egg. The marbled merlet lays one egg per year. It's a large egg, well camouflaged in the forest. You can see here the, uh, the duff, the moss on the nest branch. The marbled merlet, it turns out, doesn't actually build a nest. It just lays its eggs on the available moss on the branch in the, uh, in the high limbs of the forest. And as I mentioned, the uh, merlet is the size of a robin. Its egg is the size of a small chicken egg. And here um, is 
our friend, the Marble Merle at Chiak High on a branch. This is about 25 miles east of Seattle. And this is a unusual photograph. And I'm gonna show you in just a minute, the videotape, it's three minutes of this chick sitting on its nest. And I know most of us um, are hunkered down right now. Hunkered is the word for this marble merlet's behavior. It is still and silent for 85% of its month long time on the nest as it develops. The parents bring fish once to seven times a day and then leave the chick alone. So it's here for one month, just hunkering. All right, let me see if I can do this. Oh, nope. Okay, hold on. The chick is essentially defenseless. So the camouflage and the stillness are part of its defense or protection from predators such as jays or ravens or owls that could be in the forest. A risky move coming up here. And it will snap at insects, also dangerous. Got to be really careful here. If it falls, it lands on the forest floor and will not be able to fly again. It cannot take off from the ground. And you'll see the photographer has, um, is using a GoPro and we'll show you in a minute the tree above the chick and then down below. You'll get a sense of how far above the forest floor the bird is. So that's as much protection as the merlet has above from the weather, from rain, snow even. You can see it was getting a little buffeted around by the wind. Okay, there you go. That is the day in the life of a marble merlet chick, three minutes of its 30 days on the nest. And this video I'm gonna show you next is uh, the prey delivery. So this is an adult merlet on the left, a parent bringing a whole fish to its chick. Uh, this happens one to seven times a day, depending on the age of the chick and how far the uh, nest is from the coast. Okay, let me just figure out this. There we go. And the chick will swallow the fish whole and head first. And that's it. That's a meal for the marble murrelet. 
And after about 30 days, it um, develops this uh, striking black and white plumage, it's juvenile feathers, and then takes off from the nest, never having flown before to an ocean it's never seen um, on its first flight, uh, not accompanied uh, by its parents or in a group of uh, fellow uh, fledglings and makes its way to the ocean where it begins to uh, dive and behave uh, like the seabird that it is. So this story of the marbled merlet and the men and women working to discover the mysteries of it are in my book, Rare Bird. Uh, on the left here is the uh, hardback that came out in 2006 and then the uh, reissue uh, by Mountaineers Books in 2014. So from there, um, I had moved up to Olympia, Washington and uh, did not know what to write about next. And I looked everywhere, everywhere for stories. I was gonna write about the rivers and the moss and the plants and the trees and the fish and the estuaries and everything. It was so exciting to be here in the Pacific Northwest. And I uh, did not think once about writing about the rain until I accidentally encountered this beautiful poster of the clouds uh, in 2008. And stepping closer to this poster, which was in the friend, uh, a friend's hallway, realized I knew nothing about clouds. And I had lived under clouds for, at that time, about 50 years and had observed essentially nothing about them. I didn't know their names. I looked at these pictures and I didn't recognize most of the clouds. And I wondered how could I be on this planet and not have ever seen any of these clouds before? What was wrong with me? So I started looking up and Observing the clouds is a wonderful activity, especially now when we are like the Merlet chick hunker down, hopefully. Uh, looking up at the clouds, it's free. You don't need any equipment. The sky is changing all the time. It's this universal um, phenomena of natural wonder. Uh, it can fill you with joy and awe and you can just do it from your front yard. So I just began looking and trying to um, see the clouds to figure out what I could learn about them and to notice what I saw. And there's a difference between observing something, noticing something, seeing something, and then noticing what you see. And what I was seeing completely blew me away. I had never seen this kind of variety before. I knew it was up there, but I had never taken the time to look. So I looked and looked and looked, trying to figure out what could I learn about the clouds myself. It wasn't that much. They're very difficult to study. They don't explain themselves. And I realized, you know, early on in our lives, most of us, uh, our first connection to the clouds is by looking up and seeing what kinds of shapes they, they take on. This one looked like a big monster. This is coming over uh, um, Bud Inlet here. And it looked like a big monster with its wings swept back. It's sort of in profile. We love seeing shapes and clouds and animals and clouds, but often we kind of look away afterwards and think nothing else of the clouds. We also admire clouds at sunset. We call it a sunset, but really it's the clouds that makes this so dramatic. And I was interested to know what makes these clouds so beautiful. Why do they turn all these colors? And why did we really only look at clouds and really appreciate them as sort of backdrops at sunset or backdrops for, for photographs? We all know some clouds. I was rather surprised moving to this very cloudy part of the world um, in Olympia. I think we have clouds 228 days a year. Why more people didn't know about clouds? And I think more people were like me. They just, they paid attention early on and then they kind of forgot about the clouds. And then it became something you looked at to tell about the weather or to make a backdrop for a photograph. And I found out that what most of us know is that we have different types of clouds. And one of the most popular is cumulus. Most people uh, knew about that cloud, these nice um, puffy sort of happy clouds or the, uh, the icon of the cloud. Uh, we're familiar with thunderheads also known as cumulonimbus, a, uh, a rainy cloud that brings rain. This is a photograph taken up in Nisqually uh, uh, refuge here of, of thunderheads. We also might be familiar with the cloud called mare's tails or cirrus. These are the high wispy clouds um, that we see in the sky. We also might wonder about these clouds, contrails. Um, are they clouds? Are they natural clouds? Are they from airplanes? What are they made of? I didn't know 
any of this. And the more I looked at the clouds, the more kind of overwhelmed I, overwhelmed I became. Um, this cloud um, is known as the Lenny, uh, one of the most extraordinary and um, sort of out of this world clouds uh, known as Alto Cumulus Lenticularis because lenticular means like a lens, a lens shape because these clouds have this very smooth look, almost like a stack of plates and they form in the lee of mountain ranges. Mount Rainier is sort of a, a specialist in producing these types of clouds. They look like flying saucers or something that would have landed from, from outer space and were responsible for um, starting the UFO craze um, in the 40s. So this is a really unusual uh, formation, this particular one right here, but you will see these over Mount Rainier and other other tall peaks. I didn't know how they formed and I certainly didn't know um, to call them by their nickname Lenny, but when you're out in the Pacific Northwest, people apparently know their clouds by their, by their nicknames. Then there were all sorts of clouds that I just had to shake my hand at. What, you know, what, what are these? What are they called? What are they, what are they doing up there, right? What about this one? This was over my home. Just on every, any given day, these were all pictures essentially taken from my front yard. I wasn't even sure these were clouds, in fact. And what about this? It looked like some weird urban art installation. So I was dazzled by the clouds, but all my observations weren't really leading me to anything like a book. And I had to do a lot of research, a lot of study of meteorology, a lot of interviews. I had a, a meteorologist I called almost every day asking him, what kind of cloud is this? Because I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. So it took me a good eight years of research to put together um, my book called A Sideways Look at Clouds. And where I started with that book was at basically square one, what is a cloud? I realized after looking at clouds for years, I didn't know what a cloud was. So I looked up the definition in the dictionary. I came up with this uh, sort of a compilation of about 10 different definitions. A cloud is a visible mass of water droplets or ice crystals suspended in the atmosphere above the earth. But great, perfect. Well, I had some problems. I really didn't know what any of these words meant. So I decided to make each of these 10 words one of the chapters in my book. And within each of those chapters, I would talk about one, one of the cloud types. So first things first, water. This took me so long and so much struggle to understand water. This is what clouds are made of, water. We are told the water molecule is H2O, two um, parts uh, hydrogen, one part oxygen. Well, that, that might be true, but it does not look like this red and white molecule that we have in our textbooks from very beginning of school. We might have them hanging uh, made out of styrofoam balls in our classrooms. This is not what a water molecule actually looks like. This is just a sort of a concept um, of a water molecule. It also does not look like um, this little blue guy down here known as Mr. Drippy, which is the uh, US Geologic Survey's uh, icon, uh, its ambassador to teach uh, young kids about the water cycle. Water in the atmosphere never appears in this teardrop shape. And this was kind of a shocker for me because I'd grown up with these two figures um, learning about water. In fact, water in the atmosphere is shaped as a sphere. And clouds are made up of water in this spherical shape. And right, wait, what? Water is spherical? How does that happen, right? I thought it was teardrop shape, no. This question here, wait, what? It's not really a question, it's more a meme, is what sort of keeps me going uh, as I'm writing and learning about new things. Wait, what tells me, wait a minute, this is really interesting, I need to know more about it. This doesn't make any sense. And that helps me try to sort of hone my observation skills. I have to have time to look at something, time to be amazed and awed and confused and perplexed and ask more questions. The other thing that is in the clouds in addition to liquid water is uh, ice crystals. I did not know that clouds were made out of ice crystals. And when you sit on the ground on a sunny day and you look up at these beautiful clouds, it's really hard to imagine there's ice in them, but there is. And these are just some of the beautiful forms of uh, that water takes when it's frozen in the atmosphere. So you have 
water as liquid, water as ice, and then you have this other magic ingredient, um, dirt. And dirt and water together are what make clouds. Uh, and dirt comes in all sorts of forms. It's actually called condensation nuclei or particulates or aerosols. All these different things here, ash, pollen, dust, and salt are in our atmosphere in, in huge quantities. And that is what the water uh, condenses uh, on and then crystallizes um, to form our clouds. So just water and dirt. If you give me water and dirt, I'll make a mud pie. But the atmosphere makes beautiful clouds. Those clouds, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, of just an unquantifiable number of clouds to be seen. However, the World Meteorological Organization uh, has listed 10 as the number of main cloud types. And here they are. These names really threw me for a loop. Um, they are uh, long and confusing and Latin and I almost wanted to give up writing because of these horrible Latin names. In my book, I explain why these names are the way they are, why they're confusing, why you should love them, and also why you should ignore them if you want to. The most important thing for me was not learning the Latin names, but paying attention, observing the clouds. I made a habit of sitting outside for five minutes a day watching the clouds. Sounds easy, it's really challenging. And it's really challenging for many reasons. One, if you don't like to sit still, it's challenging. Also, it's really hard to look at one cloud for five minutes or look at anything for five minutes straight. And I found my eye was looking all over. I was looking at this cloud, then that cloud, then this butterfly, and then that bug, and then, oh, the car in the road. And I kept getting distracted and distracted and distracted. Eventually, we're talking about five or six tries, I got to the point where I could stare at a cloud for five minutes and it, the whole world opened up and I was watching clouds essentially forming and disappearing right before my eyes. And this, I would say the five minute cloud was the most challenging part of writing my book um, next to finishing it. So I finished that book, um, A Sideways Look at Clouds, uh, published in uh, 2017 by Mountaineers Books. And I had spent an awful lot of time looking at clouds and also looking at clouds in water and swimming in water under clouds. And I thought, well, why don't I write a book about swimming? I love to swim outdoors in lakes. So I thought, well, let's write a book about uh, swimming. So I started swimming uh, two summers ago, every chance I got, I swam in March and I swam. All our vacations were about swimming and swimming and swimming and swimming. And I have this thing called um, attention surplus disorder. So while I'm working on this project, I also fell in love with another bird, a, a crazy cousin of the marble merlet known as the pigeon guillemot. This is a charming, dynamic, hilarious, clownish bird um, in the Alcid family. Uh, the pigeon guillemot is about the size of a pigeon. It is a common bird in um, the Salish Sea um, um, up through, uh, from from basically Southern California, kind of the same range as the marble merlet, but it extends beyond uh, the Pacific Northwest into Alaska and then down into um, the Northern uh, uh, Islands of Japan. So this is another uh, pursuit diver, a uh, fast swimmer underwater. It's got the webbed feet here. Um, this is not a typical picture being underwater, but these are the birds and you might have seen them um, from our coastline, from some of the parks around the Salish Sea or from the ferry crossings back and forth um, between the islands. These are um, uh, wonderful birds with black and white plumage with a stark wing band and then these bright vermilion linings of their mouths and these bright, bright red feet. And when they come flying in, it is really fun to watch. They're bright red feet backlit in the sun coming into the land. They are seabirds and they spend most of their time um, offshore and come inland in the summer just as the merlets do. But these uh, guillemots do not nest in trees. Um, here's one. Uh, you can get the good, good feel marks and see those beautiful red feet and that very distinctive wing patch there, their sharp beak. Um, the the guillemot nests um, 
in burrows uh, here in South Puget Sound, these are burrows that could have been excavated by a kingfisher um, or another bird um, or partially excavated by the guillemot itself. And they are burrows that go deep into these um, erosional bluffs along um, our, our shorelines here. You'll see them all along Salish Sea here in Olympia at Four Foot Park. We have some colonies there um, all around. And also um, they nest in sort of uh, rock, rocky uh, outcrops, um, uh, also in derelict uh, fishing piers, lots of different um, locations, but they are uh, cavity nesting birds um, in, this, in this instance. And they come, they come inland, they gather just offshore. You can stand on the beach and watch these birds. They're very vocal. They've got these trilling whistle calls and they are usually at this time of year right now beginning to come in and you'll see them chasing each other and flying over the water and dancing. They're very gregarious. They look like they are having a really great time and they are there for you to watch and observe um, if you're quiet and still and pretend to be a piece of driftwood um, on the beach. Um, you can get a really good look at them. Um, this is what their burrows look like. And these are, um, as I said, they're, they're, I didn't say they're colonial birds. So they nest in these colonies. Um, and we have uh, colonies, uh, you know, anywhere from say 10, 20, 30, 40 birds um, um, around the Salish Sea. And you might have noticed some of these burrows and not known what they were there for. They, they could be you know, owls in there, they could be kingfisher in there. Um, uh, it doesn't, there are lots of different animals that, that could live in these, but these particular ones that guillemots use. And I got interested in these birds when I became part of the fabulous um, citizen science project um, that's run through the Nisqually Reach Nature Center. And it was started up in uh, Whidbey Island uh, by the Audubon Society there. And they began just being curious about the guillemots that were around Whidbey Island, developed a protocol for citizen science to go out, spend one hour on the beach once a week and just observe how many birds were out on the water, what kinds of fish they were bringing into their chicks, uh, uh, what they were doing, what disturbances uh, caused them to change behavior such as bald eagles or boats going by. And this project really got me to fall in love with our uh, sort of coastal ecosystem and in particular these birds and their, their life cycle um, in Puget Sound. So here's a, just another example of those same burrows and you can see these are very active dynamic erosional um, bluffs, um, sandstone and the um, you can see the trees that are coming down here. The Guillemot habitat is dynamic so you'll see burrows sort of coming and going over time. And you might have walked along a beach just like this all throughout Puget Sound and not really noticed these burrows before, but now you can look and imagine that there could be a guillemot there. And you, if you listen carefully, you can also hear the guillemots um, um, singing and follow them uh, to their nest. So like the marble merlet, um, they, they lay an egg. They lay one or two eggs, typically two every, every year. Um, this is a little uh, fluff ball of a, of a pigeon guillemot chick. The parents bring fish to the nest um, to feed the chick, just like with the merlet, whole fish. Um, in this case, the most common that we see on the beach, uh, the surveyors um, are seeing gunnel and sculp and sometimes cod and perch. They are opportunistic feeders. Um, we're not, whoops, not, whoops, <laughs> not really sure what they um, are feeding on for themselves, but we can see what they are bringing into the nest and we make careful record of those different fish. Um, so we can learn more about the ecosystems of Puget Sound, uh, the forage fish populations, and the, uh, the guillemots are uh, known as an indicator species, which really tells us that by studying them, uh, we can learn a lot more about the health of Puget Sound, the abundance of forage fish and the other um, uh, uh, animals and uh, kelp forest even that these birds could be affiliated with. Um, so they're a really important bird because they're easy to study, because citizen scientists, um, not professional scientists necessarily, can study them and collect data on these birds. And uh, we have years and years of data that is now collected and being used uh, not only um, 
by the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, but by University of Washington, Department of Natural Resources. Um, the Nisqually Reach Nature Center is where my data goes, but we also have a group on Whidbey Island, on, on Bashan, um, in Clallam County, on, on Bainbridge Island as well. There are teams out um, studying their guillemots there. And here, after that little black fluff ball um, grows up, this is its juvenile plumage uh, before it um, dons that uh, dramatic black and white uh, plumage. So very, uh, a little closer to a marbled merlet uh, than you might like if you're trying to identify your zebras. So um, with that, I will stop for a minute here and just make the point that um, observational science is really fun and it's what early 20th century, not 21st century, naturalists would do. They would just go out and look. And I urge all of you, the first step in really taking pleasure and understanding our natural world is, is to look. So, okay. Then, Reagan, I will let you do this next part here. If you want to do Q&A or the trivia. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, why don't we actually introduce Terrence Lee for a minute to talk about their training coming up? Um, so we're lucky tonight to have Terrence Lee from the Nisqually Reach Center who runs the Pigeon Guillemont surveys. Um, I also have done these surveys for the last couple summers and that's how I met Maria Ruth was doing a bird survey with her. And realizing that she was amazing <laughs> and we had to get her to the estuary and to be part of what we do. Um, so Terrence, why don't you go ahead and talk a little bit more about the program and your training that is coming up soon. Yeah, so we've been doing Pigeon Gomont surveys here in South Sound uh, for eight years now and we are basically trying to get a handle on their population abundance in this area. As Maria had mentioned, these are an indicator species. So uh, they're here year round for the most part and they do rely on fish species that are common. So the general thought is that if these birds are not doing well, there's something seriously wrong with Puget Sound. Uh, so we typically survey for these birds in the summer from June through about August or September. And we go out once a week and we sit on the beach for an hour and we essentially look at these birds and we see what they're doing. We see what they're feeding their young and we document all of that information. This information is then shared with the state and the state actually uses this information to determine what is the current population status trend. So that's pretty exciting from that standpoint. And so uh, we typically have around say 50, 60 volunteers assisting with surveys in the South Sound area. Uh, we do have a training that is coming up in May. We've not yet set a date, but we are hoping to have that figured out by next week. Uh, right now, we are looking primarily for folks to help out with our Olympia area sites. Um, and by Olympia, I mean like within 15, 20 miles of Olympia. Um, and so if you're interested in spending one hour a week in the morning on the beach, uh, I would love to talk to you. And if you happen to actually live on any of these beaches that have these types of habitats, I would also like to talk to you. So um, I will put my contact information in the um, Q&A or the chat and you can connect with me that way. Great, right, thank you. Yes, um, it's a really amazing program. Um, if you are interested in developing skills to be a scientist or just want to contribute, um, I highly recommend reaching out to Nisqually Reach and trying to be a part of this program or any other programs that they have. Um, thank you, Terrence. It's good to see you. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Uh, bye. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and move on to the question and answer. Um, so on your screen, you should see a little um, option for Q&A. If you have any questions for Maria, you're welcome to um, add them there and I will read them out to her and we'll answer them. Um, great, and then while we're waiting to see if we get any questions, um, Maria, I do have a question for you. Mm -hmm. 
They say that when people get into birding, there's always one bird that's their bird that gets them started down that path. Was it the marble murelets for you or was it a different bird? It was definitely the marble girlette. I would not have considered myself a birder, really. I don't think I really owned a pair of binoculars um, before I started in with the murlet. And it turns out you don't really need binoculars to see a murlet because you'll never see them anyway. But um, I, you know, I, I think I might have done a, a backyard bird count for half the time and then didn't submit my data. So, you know, wasn't very committed to it. And it, it's, I kept thinking I should be and that, that I should be really committed to a bird or some birds. And I just couldn't, uh, just didn't feel it. So uh, I think I had to wait for this perfect bird to come along and it was de definitely the right combination. The merlet, you know, the, the, the swimming, the flying, uh, the fact that it was so um, threatened and uh, that most of the literature on it was uh, basically in, in with the scientists. There was nothing out there for the general reader um, to fall in love with this bird the way I did. So yeah, it was that one. And I really, I felt sort of hook, lion and sinker. And you know, it did, as I mentioned, uh, move, uh, caused me to convince my husband to move uh, us, my um, two kids, us and the dog from Virginia to California so that I could be closer to its habitat. So I guess it's good that I waited a while. I, you know, <laughs> but I don't think I have room for maybe, I have room for the pigeon guillemot, maybe not any other birds to sort of take over my life, but it's been, it's been a, a fabulous uh, experience uh, and great to be in such beautiful places, the old growth forest and the coast to study these birds. So uh, yeah, that was, that was my bird. Yeah, um, they, they're adorable and they're amazing. It, I think it is kind of a hard tie between them and the pigeon guillemots because the guillemots just have so much personality when we watch them on the, on the beaches. Um, yeah, that's really cool. So we don't have any questions right Hi. now that I see, unless you guys see any popping up. Um, let's see here. Okay, if you are having issues Submitting a question, um, you can email center at sseacenter.org and I'll be checking our emails to see if we get any that way. Let's see here. Okay, but we can come back too if I see anything pop up. Did we get one? Okay, we have one from, um, I think it's Kylie Hanish. Uh, what is the topic of your next book? And they're very excited about that. <laughs> well, that the next book is going to be on the pigeon guillemot. So that is what I'm, I'm aiming for. I had started uh, writing about lakes and lake swimming in Washington. And that, that's sort of the back burner right now. Uh, we have a lot of books in Washington. And I, uh, I, you know, it's a huge topic. And what, what do you say about lakes? I mean, you know, you could write encyclopedias of worth of information on lakes. So I'm just, I'm, I'm swimming and exploring and I want to understand what's what's in a lake, uh, what different kinds of lakes they are. Um, is it safe to go in a lake to swim? Uh, what's in there? Why are the fish in there or not in there? Um, and kind of understand uh, lakes from a sort of uh, geological and social and recreational point of view. I don't really know what that means. So I'm just right now swimming um, and figuring all that out. Um, so. In the meantime, the, this book on the Pigeon Guillemot um, and the Citizen Science Project, because I think it's um, uh, probably a more critical story right now. Um, so many of our seabirds are struggling and we have massive die-offs um, that are recorded when the forage fish um, population crashes or when the ocean temperatures warm and the fish population crashes, we get huge seabird die-offs and um, the guillemot for right now is stable and um, I, I want to write about this charming entertaining bird. I love spending time sitting on the beach. Uh, we are collecting data for an hour but when you sit there you are collecting so much more than data. Your experience of the beach, of the sunrise, of the tides, of everything that's washing up and coming in, the eagles overhead, the harbor seals, the loons. It is so rich that I could probably get about 10 books out of it. I'm going to try to focus on the Pigeon Guillemot and on the people who are the citizen scientists, the volunteers, 
who spend their summers coming down to the beaches and have really wonderful stories to tell about their experiences and their deep uh, and developing connection to uh, the place that is uh, Puget Sound. So that's, that's what I'm working on. Thanks for the question. Good question. Um, okay, so next one we have is, where was your favorite place you went swimming when you were writing your book? So you're still in the process of writing that book. So. I'm still in the process. So the place, um, uh, it was uh, Jade Lake um, up in the Alpine Lakes Wilderness. Um, and it was last summer and it was um, a really strenuous hike, uh, sort of a two day thing. Uh, up a, a scree slope where there was really no trail whatsoever. You just had to kind of pick your way up this slope and you're way up in uh, this wilderness area. And you come down and you see this stunningly beautiful lake that looks completely artificial. It's got the, um, the sort of um, glacial melt, that sort of fine uh, flower almost that is refracting the sunlight and causing it to turn this beautiful shade of it. I, it's not really turquoise. It's not really jade, more like turquoise. And um, it was still lots of snow around it. And um, it was really, 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 really cold. And um, I got in and I, I lived. And the problem, the problem is once I get in, which takes me a really long time, I want to stay in. And the longer I stay in, the more risk I am for getting hypothermia. So this, this real challenge, here I am in this beautiful lake, you know, all by myself. The most magical thing was sitting on the shore of this beautiful lake, a, an, uh, an osprey flew off from across the shore over the water and this white bird or the white underwing turned the color of the lake just for a moment as the wings turned and then it went back over the land and the wings then went back to their white color. It was absolutely surreal. So that was my perfect moment. And I really doubt I will ever have another such swim um, in another lake, but that, that was the peak for now. Yeah. Uh, that sounds pretty amazing. <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> okay, so our next question is, is there a minimum height for a tree to house a marble murelette? Mm, nope, they, um, they typically, I think the low uh, nest height is 50 feet. That's the minimum. So um, generally, however, they are in trees that are uh, 150, 200 feet high. Um, why, why such tall trees? Well, those are generally older trees and older trees have wider branches in the tops and that's, what the merlets need a little bit uh, wider. They say the minimum is four inches, but that's uh, on the low end of the scale. Um, they typically need a little bit wider branch um, to nest on. So the height doesn't matter. It's really the width of the platform. Uh, the platform is the sort of scientific name of the branch um, where they make their nest. Um, and because they're, they're web-footed birds, um, they don't, um, have the anatomy, let me see if I can do it, to perch, so to grab onto a branch. So they essentially have these flat webbed feet that they come in on the branch and sort of land flat footed on the branch. So they need a wide branch to enable them to land uh, safely and not sort of go pitching off the other side. So those, those large branches tend to occur higher up in the trees. And those also are ones that are safer from uh, ground predators that would uh, eat the egg or the chick. Okay, great. Okay. So if, you, if you plan to seed now, you could maybe have a good merlet tree in a hundred years. That's, we need more of them for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we have one more. Um, she says that she's looking forward to your next book as well. Okay. Um, and she's asked, what beach do you typically sit on when gathering data? Um, so this might be a little bit of a Maria and a Terrence question too. Um, so I'll leave open up to you guys. Sure, I can I can talk specifically about where I go, and then Terrence can expand more. Um, uh, I've been to a couple different beaches. Um, they are uh, private access on um, Eld Inlet. Um, I've been also over at uh, in downtown Olympia at Hearthfire. 
the restaurant there. There were guillemots there. I thought might be nesting under the old uh, derelict dock structure, but turns out they were just sort of, you know, loitering there instead. Um, and then uh, another uh, site out further at a beach known as Edgewater, which is also on um, Eld, Eld Inlet. Yeah, um, so we, we typically survey a lot of different beaches. I think at last count we had close to 50 or more beaches in South Sound that we survey. And we kind of take beaches and we subdivide them. So that kind of artificially inflates the number of beaches. But uh, basically as Maria showed in her uh, presentation, anywhere that you have this kind of tall bluff habitat, um, that's typically where we would be surveying. Not all tall bluffs have nesting habitat. Uh, but we haven't actually been to all bluffs in South Sound. So uh, there's a lot of places we haven't looked and a lot of places where we do know that there are guillemots. And uh, yeah, so if you actually want to get out and see them or you want to see their habitat, a good local place is Burfoot County Park, uh, where actually Reagan, I know she does the Beach Naturalist Program. So yeah, it. it it's actually a really good place because the birds there have actually gotten acclimated to people. So uh, there's a pretty good chance of actually seeing them and not spooking them. Otherwise they're a pretty skittish bird. Okay, um, we actually got another question in uh, from Diana Aiken. Hi, Diana Aiken. Uh, will the murelets nest in a suitable Sitka spruce with 10 miles, within 10 miles of the ocean? Yes, if if there is a suitable platform. So you can have a, you can have a, a old Sitka spruce within 10 miles, but if it doesn't have a platform on it that works for the merlet, um, they will not likely nest though, or, or if they do, the nest won't um, succeed. So it has to, it has, the platform is really the key. That wide mossy covered limb it has to have a little bit of overhead cover so to give some protection from sun and weather and predators as well uh, so yeah uh, but Sitka spruce is one of the species um, that they do nest in yes and 10, 10, 10 miles is good 55 miles inland they're there well so yeah yeah it's, it's amazing that they can go in that far yeah um, okay, so we'll see um, if anybody else has a question. We'll move on if we don't get another question here in just a minute. Those are all really great ones. Okay, so we're going to move on to something very exciting. Um, this was Maria's idea, so I'll let her go ahead and take over again. Okay, we can operate the controls here. Here we go. Okay, so I have a copy of my book to send, signed if you like, to the first person to email the correct answer to this question. What is the Latin or scientific name for the cloud known as a Lenny? And this was in my presentation and I made sure I slowed down on that slide and said the name. So if you know the scientific name, the two part scientific name for the cloud known as a Lenny. Okay, just email the answer. Okay, that's one. Should we wait for the winner or just move to the next one? In well, case let's go ahead and move to the next one. Just everybody. Yeah. Okay, then a free copy, signed, sealed, delivered of Rare Bird uh, to the person who can name one of the names of the marbled Marilet. I don't even know if I could name that right now. <laughs> there are so many. Okay, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for doing that, Maria. Was there are welcome. Are, those are the two? Okay. Yeah, yeah that's really exciting. Two. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, and then I just have one, um, this last slide here, um, uh, just so you know, um, I have uh, information on the, um, the Guillemot um, Citizen Science Project down there. Um, two, two websites, um, pigeonguillemot.org is the um, Guillemot Research Group website up on Whidbey Island. There's some beautiful videos of these birds um, 
uh, and other information on there. Great pictures by Govinda Rosling. You'll get a sense of how wonderful these crazy red feet are. Um, you can hear their calls and all that. And then um, Terrence um, has information, um, his email um, also at um, nisqually, sgre.org. There's links there to citizen science and then Pigeon Guillemot. So you can find out more about the training and the project and what's going on there. And um, my books are still available in print. You can get them directly from Mountaineers Books, from Browsers Books in Olympia, and also from Orca Books. So those are three um, bookstores. I'm sure you can, if you want, can Google them um, and find out. And there's more information, videos, pictures, et cetera, on clouds and merlets and lakes and such and guillemots on my website, mariaruthbooks.net. So that is my pitch. <laughs> I hope you all get interested and just fall in love with this beautiful world we have here. And I know everyone has been so patient hunkering down at home and exploring their backyard and their, their dandelions and their dirty house, but it's really gonna be great to get out and get to some of our beaches and our parks. And so this is gonna be a wonderful uh, experience to take all this uh, joy uh, out into the world. Um, and learn about some of these great things that we have got here. So, um, yep. I do have exciting news. We have a winner for Yay! the Sideways Look at Clouds, Mary Burcham. Uh, hello, okay. Mary, um, has submitted an answer. So, Yay! if anybody else um, wants to try to win that book on um, the Marvel Murelettes, um, please go ahead and email us and we will get that to you as soon as we can. Oh, that looks exciting. Congrats, Mary. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, Marie, I can't thank you enough for doing this with us. Um, it was my pleasure. Uh, yeah, it, you're so right about right now being a time for us to really go out and observe our world and enjoy it for what it is when we are um, in a position to help others by staying home. Um, I'm really excited to try the five minute cloud challenge. I am also somebody that has a hard time sitting still for five minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so this will be very entertaining and I encourage everybody watching to also try if you do ha um, have any stories from your experience of doing your five minute cloud challenge, um, you're welcome to share that with us. Uh, we would love to hear it. And then again, my name is Reagan. I am the program and volunteer coordinator with the Puget Sound Estuarium. We are located here in Olympia, Washington. Um, we have been moving to doing more online activities for people while we are going through this pandemic. Um, we have uh, started our own online estuary education. Um, so if you're a parent or somebody who is close to children or knows um, parents that need help, we do have resources available on our website where they can do lessons and there's videos and activities. Um, different things for them to do since schools are going to be closed for the rest of this year. And then we will also try to do more of these Discover Speaker Series um, as they come up. And if you're interested in becoming a volunteer with us, um, you can check out our website and submit a volunteer application and we'll get back to you with more information on how to volunteer. All right. Well, thank you so much, Maria and Terrence. You're um, welcome. Really thank you. Great. Yes. Thanks and for I having us. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's a new reality. Like I said before, it's a new reality. We're all yeah. getting used to it. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for putting this on. Yep. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. All right. Good night, everybody.